Well, good morning. This is Scott Mays here, and I want to welcome all you guys for jumping in with us. And I know we have a wealth of of uh, just pastors and teaching and probably a lot of degrees out there. And I'm joined by Dr. Jim Wicker today. Uh, I pastor locally here and graduated in 98 and again in 06 because I, I just needed more. Uh, my wife said I needed more after after the second time. But Dr. Wicker, thanks for being with us today. We're going to talk today about teaching through and preaching through the book of Revelation, and I need this. I'm 52, I've pastored 27 years, and I've never been brave enough to tackle Revelation on Sunday morning. Take a minute, introduce yourself, would you? Sure. Uh, Jim Wicker, I was uh, I graduated here twice with my master's, then my PhD, and then was a pastor for 19 years, and planned to do that till I retired. The, but I felt Lord, the Lord called me to then come to Southwestern and train the next generations, which I've been doing since 2000, and love it. I teach, uh, of course, I love being a pastor, too. I teach New Testament and biblical hermeneutics, which is how to interpret the Bible. And it's, it's been a great privilege to do that. And I found that there's a, a wonderful, a great interest, especially lately, in Revelation. So I thought this would be a timely topic for today. So uh, at Revelation or Revelations, does that matter? <laughs> yeah. So I have a tie that has Bible books on it and has Revelation with the end on it. And that's one of my pet peeves. So yes, the Revelation, which is the apocalypse, the unveiling uh, that God gave uh, John. And so, yes, there's one, <laughs> actually several visions, but one book of Revelation. I guess that because <laughs> yeah. it's a pet peeve of mine. Yeah. So let's start out here. What is the difference between teaching through Revelation and preaching through Revelation? So the the basic, of course, question of difference between teaching and preaching, of course, in preaching, you more advocate a view, and in teaching, you typically spend more time to give the different views. But I think there's no more uh, of a difference than in the book of Revelation, because as Baptists and even evangelicals, a lot of the scriptures we come to will have the same interpretation. But Revelation, when we deal with eschatology, the end times, then while there's core issues we agree on, there's secondary or tertiary issues we can disagree on and, and do it agreeably. So there's more of a difference then with these various views that other good Bible-believing conservative Christians can have. But in a sermon, it's difficult to give the various viewpoints um, just by the way a, a sermon is. So I think with the sermon, you more advocate your interpretive view of Revelation, and you preach that, at the same time you want to work into that sermon that there are other views that are still viable or possible, let's say. But in teaching, you can then give more time to each of those views. And so I think that's the main difference. And in, in preaching, you're going to advocate a view. And of course, you're going to more often in preaching, look for those times of application. Okay, so what does this mean to me today? And what did it mean to the people that read it back in John's day? That's good. Okay, so a lot of times we do verse by verse. Do you recommend going through verse by verse through the book of Revelation? For the book of Revelation, I like verse by verse as the general rule for preaching. But what my suggestion is for Revelation is to do it in three different series because it's just it's going to be so long if you do it verse by verse. Um, so I would recommend doing one sermon series on um, the the introduction, uh, the the vision of Jesus in chapter one, and it can be an overview and that beautiful vision that, that you have. You can get several sermons out of that um, that that vision of Jesus. Then you can follow up with chapters two and three on the seven churches of Revelation. Well. Really, you can have a sermon for each of those churches and then one as an introduction. So there's a eight-week series. Then I would do um, four through 22. But even then, if you do verse by verse, it, again, it depends on what you're wanting to accomplish. Um, if, you, if, you're, if your congregation is used to a sermon series going for a year, year and a half or two years, then that's great. However, other congregations, they're used to sermons in, let's say, three or four month period. So in that situation, I still divide it up into those three sections. One, and then, well, let me say, um, excuse me, four. Four sections, let me back up. So chapter one, 
two and three, the seven churches, four and five, the church, the chapters on worship. I'm for, forgive me for, mid, for getting there for a minute. No worries. So that's, those are great sermons on worship in four and five, and then six through 22. But again, if your congregation is used to, and you're used to preaching through, like I say, three or four months series, then you might do it chapter by chapter. And in, in a chapter by chapter, or even some sermons, you might cover two chapters, like Revelation 17 and 18 about Babylon. Then you're not going to necessarily go over every verse, but you're going to hit the major verses of those chapters. So section by section can work. And that, that's helpful. And, and again, as you talk about the pacing of a church as used to in the pastor, um, you mentioned Revelation 4 and 5 just as a note. Edwards has a fantastic sermon on that in the Banner of Truth, the two-volume. Uh, back when I bought it, it was, I think it's more of a brown uh, brown uh, jacket. I don't know why I remember book <laughs> jackets. But, um, you know, it's interesting when you look at Revelation, how many great pastors, great theologians, well, it didn't tackle it. If memory serves, I don't think, I, did, I can't remember if Calvin tackled it. I don't think he did. I could be wrong there. I don't think Luther Not tackled sure. it. Uh, I'm one who buys sermons on Logos to see oftentimes how the pastor breaks it up, especially a guy older than me, and that's becoming more rare to find him older than me. <laughs> and I know Krizzle went through it, Yeah, but there are you have to be pretty brave to go verse by verse through Revelation. There's not many guys that do that. Yeah. Well, let, let's kind of delve into this. Um, how does a person determine what his view is? That's a good question. Um, so I, there are certain key texts. I think if you go to those texts, it can help you see what your interpretive understanding of Revelation is. And there's um, a handout that that will be posted throughout this webinar. And then in the follow-up, it will also be given out that gives the four main views of how to interpret a re- revelation and then the three main millennial views. So I'd recommend starting at Revelation 20, verses 1 through 7, where it mentions a thousand years, thousand years, thousand years, and then decide, okay, do you believe that's a literal thousand years? And if you do, then you're, you'd be a pre-millennial, have the premillennial view, which means there's a future literal thousand years. However, if you think, well, that's a period, and I'm not sure that it's literal, and maybe we're going through that right now. Then you'd be a postmillennialist, which says we're going through this general period, um, and I'll give more details later. But then if you go, now that's just a symbol. It's not even really a period. It's just Revelation's full of symbols, and so that's just another symbol. Then you'd be an amillennialist, which means no millennium, uh, from the alpha privative in the Greek just meaning un. Then go to Revelation chapter 12. In the first few verses, it talks about the woman that's going to bear a child, and then the dragon is fighting against the child or trying to kill the child. Well, most of us agree the dragon is Satan because then later John says the dragon is the serpent who's the devil and Satan. So that's pretty clear. But who's the woman and the child? So if you think that the woman is the church, then you're more likely a uh, what we call a historical premillennialist or a an idealist, which those have more of an emphasis on the church. And of course, most of us agree we're in the church age today, which is from the ascension of Jesus to his return. In other words, the time of the church. So is the emphasis there that, that the church brought forth the child and she's the woman, or is the woman Israel? So those of us that believe it's that the woman is Israel then we're what we call a dispensational premillennialist, which has more of an emphasis on Israel, and then um, takes the dispensational premillennialist takes more of the events or people or things that are mentioned as literal, where a, a historical premillennialist will say more of that symbolic, and so we'll kind of differ over the issue of Israel. But that's a key text as well. So let me kind of review because that was, there was a lot of information there. So when identifying what view I might be, I might I would probably go to Revelation 20 and look at the millennium and then Revelation 12, the early part, and my view regarding uh, the woman. We all, as you said, in, indicate that, that the serpent is Satan. And then you begin to kind of lay out the main interpretive view. So 
I heard you say dispensational pre, historical pre, amillennial, and postmillennial. Uh, there's not that many postmillennials around anymore. The founder of our institution, Southwestern, I believe, was one. Yes. And my understanding is postmillennials have decreased because of the prevalence of war, World War One, World War Two. It's difficult to have a postmillennial view that things are getting better. We're riding into the millennium with the Hitlers and the Idi Amin's, and it's just it, it's just hard to find that view. Yes. Um, so l- let me put you on the spot. Um, which which of those views have you identified with? So I grew up under the preaching of Dr. Criswell at First Baptist Dallas, and he was a dispensational premillennialist, and that was back in the days of Hal Lindsey's great, late great planet Earth and things like that. Which I'll say, that's one version of it, but that's not what we go to for what the the view says. But having then, since then, examined the different viewpoints through the years, going to college and coming here to seminary, I haven't found another view that I found to be more persuasive. At the same time, I'll say, want to mention why, you know, a lot of preachers don't want to preach through Revelation, and they may have a different interpretive view than their congregation and that's i understand that hesitancy yeah so maybe to add in that question as well or that dilemma then i think the key is to help your people to understand there are various uh potential views that are still within the conservative interpretation of the bible and even though your view may be different There's actually a lot of points of commonality that you can make between your view and the view in your congregation. But I think another key is to be respectful of that other view. Now, what I hear at various places is from people that have different views. They make fun of the other views. Now, among colleagues, we can do that. But actually, when we're preaching and teaching, we want to be very respectful of those views. And, and yet find points of commonality. And where I find point, a lot of points of commonality is the Trinity. I mean, Revelation is more clear about the Trinity than any other New Testament book except probably First John. Mm-hmm. There's much about the Trinity. There's much about sin and judgment. Now, we may disagree on our millennial views exactly when certain events happen, but God judges sin. And we see a lot about persecution and even may disagree about who's being persecuted when. At the same time, we can agree persecution of the church has been going on since the beginning. And there's a message for people in God's day, in John's day from God, that people are be, Christians are being persecuted and they're being persecuted today and will be till the Lord comes back. And so there's many themes that you can connect with in every chapter, regardless of your view. So I think as you preach through it with a if you know your view is different from your congregation, which I know a lot of the people in the pew, so to speak, are they've been influenced by dispensational premillennialism, as you keep that in mind, even if you disagree with it, and just from time to time mention, well, you know, this other view sees it this way, but but connect with those points of commonality. I think that's, that's important. Yeah, I think it is. And I we, we just remind all of us that the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 was written to to include numerous different um, views within the eschatology. When you go there, it does not preclude um, amillennial, does not preclude uh, post or pre, So, and it's written purposely there. And I appreciate your views there regarding that, because I have been the historical, I'm a a historical pre, and um, I am in the minority within most churches I've pastored. Most of the guys uh, in 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 the ladies in our churches have believed the rapture, even if they can't fully form why they believe that this they were taught that i was taught that so you know anecdotally you're talking about the, the aspect there years ago i was pastoring in west texas in the panhandle and it was i think i told you this uh maybe a week or so back 500 people on the same night i'm being questioned i'm 31 years of age i had not written the dissertation but i'd gone through the phd seminars and the lady that was the bible expert was questioning my views on the end times because i did not believe in in free will of dispensational rapture. And I could tell that we were losing everybody else in the room. And so I, I sort of pivoted and I said, if you've heard of Spurgeon, my view is Charles Spurgeon's. And she said, no, it's not. 
Well, it made me so angry, Dr. Wicker, but I couldn't show it then because they hadn't voted on me as of yet. <laughs> and I went back to Southwestern that week, looked it up, and I was right. But I never got to tell them I was right. I, <laughs> but anyway. Yeah. Well, let me, I'll tell you a funny story about Dr. Crystal. So when Dr. Crystal came to First Baptist Dallas, Dr. Truitt had preached there almost 50 years as a post-millennialist. Yeah. But he was a product of his generation, as you said. Most people, since the great missionary times in the 1700s, 1800s, were thinking the world's getting better and better and better. It will usher in the return of Christ at the proper time. And so that's what Dr. Truett preached. So Dr. Crystal got there, who's a dispensational premillennialist, and the little old sweet lady came up to him after the service and said, well, Dr. Truett was not a premillennialist. And Dr. Crystal answered her without skipping a beat, well, he is now. <laughs> now, that's a funny anecdote. But the point is, I think we all need to have humility in that and understand that one day we'll find out uh, there's a... Uh, Probably not a good Baptist phrase, but I know um, when Dr. Patterson taught the course on Revelation, he'd say from time to time, well, here's these different options. You pay your money and make your choice. So we don't bet as, as Baptists, but here's, there's even, even within your view that you have, or say I'm, I'm dispensational pre and you're a historical pre, there are still times we come to a certain text, you know, we're just not sure, yeah. you know, the, the, Babylon in 17 and 18, I find that to be the hardest text to tackle. And so it just I say, you know, I'm not sure. So you, you make a choice and realize with humility, yeah. you know, I may be wrong in that. Preterism is, would you put that within orthodoxy or would you say that's outside of orthodox parameters? And, and what is preterism? Yeah, so preterism is a belief that this all John was writing two first century recipients about first century events. It still says it's prophecy. In fact, I mean, not every preterist agrees and not everyone in any, any of the views agrees with the rest of the people in that view. But it says that John wrote in the mid 60s about the coming judgment on Jerusalem that was going to happen in just a few years. I mean, 67 to 70. And so that's not a, a necessarily wrong view in the fact that God did bring that judgment. Jesus taught that God's going to judge Jerusalem. So in the Olivet Discourse, he talked, I believe, about the coming judgment 40 years later on Jerusalem and then the second coming. So a preterist that says, hey, I believe most of this is first century about the fall of Jerusalem and God's judgment on Jerusalem, which he did, and I believe Jesus is coming back, then I'd say that's within orthodoxy. Now, theologians disagree about some of the history of this, but I do think the earliest Christians were pre-millennial. They looked at the text, thousand years, okay, thousand years, why? Doubt that. But then time went by, and they were still expecting, I mean, they, they thought Jesus would come in their lifetime, and he didn't. So as the several centuries went by, then they started to go into other views. Um, so there, again, preterisms had its day, and yeah. it was a lot more popular earlier. And then another, another view I haven't mentioned is historicist, and historicist, that view, which you mentioned, Calvin and Luther, and all those guys were historicists, which means they thought that the the beast was the Roman Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and all of these judgments were on the Roman Catholic Church. So you see, that had its heyday all the way up to, and then especially in the Reformation, and then there's there's still some historicists, but not very many. You know. And there's idealists that put it back in the judgment on Jerusalem, though some of them then say the rest of it's God's judgment on Rome in 476, but there's not very many. Now, an idealist that would say it's all first century and Jesus came back at that point in judgment, I'd say that's not within orthodoxy. Pre preterist, it, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think R.C. Sproul's book about 20 years ago, something to the effect of Jesus according to the last days, would be a, a, a fairly uh, mainstream view of preterism if if uh, viewers are wanting to kind of get a hold of that view. But mainly, American evangelicals, post, uh, pre, and amillennial, and so those are those are some of the more helpful ones. Yeah. You mentioned persecution. Uh, anecdotally, I'm told that in places of persecution, of course, America's, we've got the privilege of not being persecuted, but some of our viewers, maybe Southwestern grads spread throughout the globe, 
that revelation is cherished even more yeah. when persecution ramps up. Yeah. Is it Nina Shea wrote a book called In the Lion's Den in the late nineties and uh nineteen nineties, I should say. <laughs> we were talking about eighteen nineties and the sixties. So nineteen nineties and sent a copy to everybody in Congress and her data showed more Christians were persecuted in the twentieth century, you know, through the end of the nineteen nineties. Right. Then all previous 19th centuries combined, and as we're now in the 21st century, that's continued. So we're we're continuing to see uh, many, many persecutions. Um, there's about over, there are around 50 Muslim countries. In other words, there are 50% or more majority Muslim. So yes, there are many persecutions. And it has, you know, for people to say, oh, if you're a futurist, then it didn't have any application in the first century. That's not true. Because even though there's persecutions in the future, it shows you how to deal with it right now. Yeah. And you brought up a great point there. We, whenever the pastor, preacher, teacher is working through this book, it has to meant, have meant something to John's original audience. Yeah. So keep that in mind. It can't, it can't all be Apache helicopters or whatever we come up with. Right. It has to be something there. Right. So, um, bunch of pastors are on here and just people who love to Bible study. I see one gentleman there in the top right corner. He's got a, a great uh, library. I, I see one of our guys on staff, Stuart Pendle, is there. And so let's talk about commentaries. Uh, isn't it true that you can never have enough books? Isn't that right? When, the, when your spouse says enough, she's wrong. Well, <laughs> yeah, there's a quote that if you have enough, when you have money, buy books. If you have more money than that, buy food. So you know, something like. But there's a lot of commentaries. What are the best? What are some of the best ones on Revelation? So in the in the handout that we're posting and also mail out, I've given in the various interpretive views some of the best commentaries in each view. Now, what I found very helpful in this English book on Revelation that I'm teaching, um, then we're. There's this book by Greg. It's called Four Views of Revelation. It has four columns, and with every pass, every let's say segment of text, what each view says. And I found that to be very helpful, even as much as I've studied Revelation, to finally have a commentary where it's side by side. Now, having said that, even commentaries like um, so for dispensational premillennialism, um, Dr. Paige Patterson wrote the volume on Revelation for the New American series. It is an excellent volume, um, but even when they're advocating one view, which most commentators do, they're going to mention the other views. Um, so uh, they, it's not that, that you're only going to see one view in that, or there's a two-volume commentary by Thomas that's excellent um, that goes into a lot more detail for dispensational premillennialism. But for historical premillennialism, um, Paul Hoskins, who is one of our graduates, and I mean, he taught here for many years, has an excellent volume on Revelation that takes that viewpoint on historical premillennialism, and a number of commentaries, the more recent ones that are premillennial, uh, take that view, even when, even in the last, let's say, 50 years, like George Eldon Ladd and ones mm -hmm. like that. Um, Tom Schreiner, who's just come out with the commentary um, in, within the last year, well, I have a review on it in our Southwestern Journal of Theology, so to promote our Southwestern Journal uh, that's coming out in the next issue. But he he's historical premillennial, but also somewhat idealist, which idealist says that um, pretty much everything in Revelation is a symbol. I mean, except for those that, you know, Jesus is coming back. Um, but other than that, it's just showing that there's these ongoing battles between God's side and Satan's side, and ultimately God is going to win, except, of course, he's already won the war at the cross. But he's going to win, ultimately, as, as Satan and all sinners will be judged. Um, but Shriners is good also for historical pre, as well as uh, the idealist view. So, um, again, I'm, I list that with Greg's four-view four commentary, he then works with the major commentaries. It's in the second edition. It's very helpful. And I'll say, going through that, I'm more appreciative of the idealist view and the historicist view to say, well, I disagree with those interpretations of Revelation, 
they are correct in they're citing these major right. events. Now, no doubt, the AD 70 fall of Jerusalem and the temple was huge. So that's major. The fall of the Western Empire in 476 is huge. And then idealist, you learn a lot of history reading that you because yeah. they're going through all the church history saying, well, this event is that. Well, I say I disagree with that view. They're right that that was a major event in church history, like when Charles Martel stopped the uh, Muslims from continuing to push westward. And again, we're going to ask our viewers in just a minute, we, you know, we're going to take questions. And so if you want to drop those into the chat or if you want to raise your hand in just a moment, um, I would add that having taught on Wednesday night, what was, as a pastor, you can get in your study and you can really get into all the commentaries. And then, you know, you're going to walk out and talk to people who just work for a living. How did I bring the esoteric down? Jim Hamilton's preach of the word, who happens to agree with my view, but his application was helpful because at some point you go, say, okay, so what? Yeah. I thought that was a good one. And then um, uh, Sam Storms, the DTS grad, the guy up in the pastor up in, uh, in Oklahoma City area, he's, I think, written sort of the modern classic on amillennial uh, view. So just a couple other great resources there, and I appreciate you doing that. Let me let me ask you. So between classic dispensational and progressive dispensational, I know we I believe we have Dr. Blazing on our faculty, and he is sort of the progressive. What what's the what's the difference there? Right, and also Dr. Jeff Bingham is progressive as well. Okay. Dispensationalism. Um, so the difference with I used to say for years I believe in dispensational premillennialism for my interpretation of Revelation, but I'm not a dispensationalist, and so. Then I had to explain. Well, dispensationalist, which I'm not knocking dispensationalist, but it's seven dispensations, and to me it seemed too cut and dried. And the way I, the way I heard it was, um, the God has to work this way in this disp dispensation. We're kind of, it seemed to me he's kind of locked into having to do that. Yeah. At the same time, I go back and say. You know, as you read the text, clearly there's a difference between before the fall and after the fall. There's a difference before the flood and after the fall. And what I mean is difference. Things happen differently that, you know, the age span drops down rapidly. And, of course, the before the fall, it was certainly different than after the fall in the judgment on sin. But to, to give a shorter answer, um, with classic dispensationalism, well, both put an emphasis on Israel, and that separates classical and progressive dispensationalism from the other views we look at israel is is a is still a key and like hebrews 11 26 uh, that um that excuse me romans eleven twenty six that says one day all israel will be saved we believe that that means one day in the future many jews will come to christ well classic dispensationalism tended to say, well, between Jesus' work at the cross and the empty tomb, and when he comes back, that's a parenthesis or a gap. And, you know, using a term like a parenthesis or gap, it sounds like, well, so what are we, chop liver, you know? <laughs> so progressive dispensationalism comes in and says, we still have that emphasis on Israel, but also this period that we're in is important. So it's not like a gap that was, you know, unexpected or whatever. Now, the reason for that is the 70 weeks in Daniel, and we believe that the 69th week led up to then Jesus coming and his work, and then the 70th week, we believe, is great tribulation in the future. But this in-between time, the progressive puts more of an emphasis that this was purposeful. This was the time when God brings in Gentiles, which, of course, he prophesied in the Old Testament. He's now bringing that to fruition, and then also part of that, as Paul wrote in Romans 9-11, through is to make the Jews jealous and to bring them to the time of coming back to accept Christ. And I'll throw in there, by the way, we've seen more Jews come to Christ in the last 10 to 20 years than we have in the history of the church since the first century. Yeah. So something amazing is happening. Yeah. I'm not saying that's saying for sure that progressive dispensation is the answer. It's my preference, but I think we all have to agree God's up to something with something special with many Jews coming to Christ, and also many Muslims coming to Christ. We've not ever seen that since Muhammad started Islam. Praise the Lord. The number of Muslims coming to Christ. It's just amazing. That is amazing. Um, 
we're going to turn our attention here in just a second again to our questions. I think you gave me your least favorite passage, which was Revelation 17 yeah. and 18. Yeah. So what you, what, what's your favorite passage in Revelation? You got one sermon. You know, you're, you're restricted to one sermon in Revelation. What's that go-to passage and why? So when I, whenever I ask for what's your favorite biblical person, I always have to say, except for Jesus, because if you don't say Jesus, you know, something's wrong. Yeah. So I would say then my favorite passage would need to be Revelation 19, started in verse 11, when Jesus comes back, yeah. because that, I mean, that's the hope. We talked about all through the, old, the New Testament. What is hope? Hope's normally the return of Christ. Yeah. But if you say, okay, that's a given, you know, that's the easy one. What's another one? Then I'd go to... Uh, the new heaven and new earth, because yeah. we might disagree on the millennium. Yeah. But Revelation 21 and 22, this brings tears to my eyes. Amen. When God will wipe away every tear from our eyes, there'll be no sin, no more death. And, you know, as preachers, and I've had many funerals, yeah. and we describe what it's like for that Christian, you know, if it's a Christian you're doing the funeral for, to be absent from the, the bodies, be present with the Lord, Second Corinthians 5, 8. And so... I believe that new heaven and new earth, part of that they're experiencing right now in heaven. Yeah. And so we even jump forth to some of those passages. We, we see the face of God. What yeah. Moses wanted to see. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, we got a question from Wes Grimm. Wes wanted a quick reminder here, and I think this is going to be on the sheet that goes out. Thank you, Wes, for joining with us. What commentary did you say has the multiple views shown side by side? And I pick up my little hand out to make sure I give the right name. It's Steve Gregg called Revelation Four Views by Thomas Nelson, and it was updated in 2013. Now, now still, that's that's 11 years out of date for the new commentaries, and like I say, the uh, Sh Tom Schreiner commentary is excellent yeah. that just came out, but it's still very good on seeing the side-by-side -side mm -hmm. the different views. Yeah, and, and I, I don't know, Wes, if you're a Logos guy. I, I have, uh, in my 40s, switched sort of more to Logos, and um, I find some great sales uh, always money is a concern for pastors and whether you're buying out of your own personal budget or you're buying out of it's the church allows you allocate some money but uh, right now there's some great sales uh, Jay Mixon thank you Jay for uh, joining with us should we be concerned about the April 8th lunar eclipse I'm so glad you're here to answer that and not me I'm so glad you answered that my, that's my wife's birthday by the way so. oh oh well that's exciting okay Wonderful question. My answer is a thousand times no. <laughs> Should we be concerned about that? So I'm going to go to Matthew 24, 36. And Jesus is talking about the second coming. And while there's different interpretations of what did Jesus talk about in the this uh, Olivet Discourse, most of us believe he's talking about the at first, the part, part of it, the 80, 70 fall of Jerusalem, then the second coming. Well, by 36, I think he's, he's in the second coming. And he said, of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father, Father alone. Now, he said day and hour, and so some go, we can know the minute, or, or we can know the month. <laughs> no, Jesus was saying by that, no one knows. Even he didn't know. Now, I think Jesus knows now, because I think once he ascended to heaven, then would he, did that, he, he, any, if he'd set aside any of his of his uh, privileges of being God, then he, he, he knows now. But we don't know. So here's what I tell my students, and I told my churches, if anyone says, I know Jesus is coming back, like at the 40th anniversary of Israel becoming a nation, or then in a few more years, the, um, the well, you know, the 80th, these multiples of 40 or whatever, that he's not, when people are saying he's coming back, then he's not. So I'm saying, Enjoy the eclipse and don't be <laughs> thinking, okay, that's the event. Because there are a lot of, and I also encourage people, please don't watch these YouTube and TikTok videos of people saying, here's all the reasons why. Like my daughter was telling me some like, oh, it goes across Bethlehem, Texas is in the path. Go, you know, in Texas, we have a name of every city you can imagine. So that's, it's meaningless. We're going to go to Becca in just a second. But one thing I'd add there. When I was a college student, a respected preacher used the 1988, the 40-year thing, and he is solid in every direction. But I remembered that, 
And I would say to all our pastors out there, there are young people or whomever age people out there and they're paying attention. And I think one of the things that may be the generation, you know, younger than me, we're, we're, there's less and less dispensational premillennials. Uh, Moeller had a, a podcast on that. I think one of it is the reaction to the date set. Yeah. And we need a humility when we walk into the pulpit. Yeah. Well, with that, let's, let's go to Becca. I'd like to just say one more thing about date setting. Even if you're totally, completely convinced about a certain date, I encourage you, please keep it to yourself because no one's going to know. And as Dr. Mays was saying, it really does a disservice to the Bible, to Christianity, uh, when when someone sets a date. Because a non-Christian doesn't know. They'll think, well, everybody must think that. And then the, the date comes and goes, and it really hurts our credibility. So, um, I mean, we can say, even I wouldn't even say, I think he's going to then. I just say, just, you know, I, I can say, I think he's coming soon, but I, I don't say he is coming like tomorrow or whatever, uh, because it could be another thousand years. So to show humility, but again, day setting, it, it does a disservice. The Jehovah's Witnesses set, I think, seven different times the date and it came and went. And then a pastor's back in 2011 was his, his fourth time to do it. He took billboards out all over the country, newspaper ads. That was Harold Camp. And yeah, he he recanted in 2012. Uh, he said he wished he hadn't done that and then died the next year. But yeah, I wish he hadn't done that because it really, it turns people off to Christianity or to even looking at Revelation. Well, as far as how deep to go, I think it all depends on how much time you have. I mean, you can do a one teaching session or one sermon and cover the whole book. So I would, I would let your time factor be the determination. Um, if it's, but the, also who you're speaking to, if it's a bunch of new Christians, I wouldn't go into a long, deep, detailed study because they're needing to, to kind of wade into the waters of, of Revelation and other, other books. So your time factor and then who your, audi- your, your congregation or audience is, I think would be the determining factor. And I'd add there, you know, Tim Keller's new book on preaching, he talks about the mobility of our society and people are moving a lot. I, I'm pastor here in Fort Worth and you may have people a total of three years. So in those three years, do I want to be preaching Revelation for half of it? Yeah. Um, another thing that could help there, you mentioned commentaries, but going and getting pastor's sermons might help the depth of it. Watching um, the two I can think of, Dr. Criswell and then Hamilton. I'm sure there are other sermons out there I'm just not aware of off the top of my head. But that that helps me go, okay, there's a guy that's done this. Yeah. And what, what should I look like in that regard? Yeah. I think we got one other question here from Joe Manning. When and how... Will you send out the notes to the list and commentaries? I think that's going to be in the notes at the uh, conclusion here. We're going to email those out. Becca, you want to add anything to that? All right. So Roy asked the question that, I, that I'm that i looking forward to, Dr. Wicker. You've been to Israel numerous times. I'm about to go my fifth time next year. So regarding recent events for in Israel and Gaza, um, particularly the, the potential expansion so I'm, I'm assuming there may be the expansion of Israel. I'm not exactly no, sure. No, expansion of the battle, I think. I think expansion of the battle. Any thoughts there? How yeah. does Revelation connect to that? So the the concern now is, I mean, in Gaza, and of course that's a terrible situation, and we need to pray for people on both sides. Um, the concern, not only about that, and everybody wants peace to come, at the same time Israel has a right to uh, defend itself, there's a concern from the north because Hezbollah has been shelling from the north and they have more effective weapons. And there's a, a very uh, good possibility that could result in something that would be a wider conflagration. So yeah, there is the possibility this could be the start of World War III. I mean, because Hezbollah, then that would bring in Iran and, and Russia in any way. So is that does that mean World War III is about to start? Does that mean that we're seeing the end of Revelation right now? And my response to that is, no one knows. So, 
I would say certainly don't be concerned that you think, okay, this is the beginning of the end. At the same time, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. So could that go into a wider conflict? It could. But our prayer should always be for God to bring peace. And the Bible says to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And so to be praying for peace to come there. Um, but again, could it be something major? Well, you know, every, I mean, both world wars started from a little small event. So there's always that potential. So we should be praying for peace. And, and um, I think on the one hand, make your plans, your one-year plan, five-year plan, 10-year plan, 20-year plan for you and your church. But on the other hand, realize that we, we don't know how much time we have left. So we're going to get to a question about Revelation 14, but I, I would like to add not so much Revelation and Bible, but over the last century or so, the Palestinians, especially in Bethlehem, have been much more responsive to Christianity than the Jewish people have. Yes. So will we take a one-sided view, and American evangelicals are, are typically pro-Israel, we need to be careful there because we we want to continue to reach both people for the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And I think another aspect, as I sort of review it, and I'm no expert, but as our nation interacts with the Israeli government, what would we want have someone said to us, having been attacked in Pearl Harbor, what were we going to do? Um, how will we go deal with ISIS, more contemporary, or Afghanistan? So I, I think we've got to show great care. Uh, we, we pray for peace. Yeah. But uh, terrorists are terrorists, and we, we, we need to be thinking about that at some level within the government. So I appreciate your comments. Let's go to Revelation 14, because I'm so glad you're here to take these easy questions. <laughs> yeah. The 144,000, Revelation 14, 1 yeah. 5, you got the 144,000 redeemed people from the earth. Can you talk about that? You mentioned a moment ago our friends and the Jehovah's Witness, and I think they kind of messed that one up. Yeah, they they got it wrong, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and they got a lot of things wrong um, because they're not, they're not Christian for sure. Um, and we know that because they don't believe Jesus is God. Modern day Aryans. Yeah, so the 144,000, which also is mentioned in, in Revelation 7, the dispensational premillennial, and when I say that, I mean both th that and the progressive dispensational premillennial. Um, we take that as a literal by 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes and in the future. So the, the dispensational uh, view will look at more of these events as literal than any of the other views. So we believe that's in the future, after the rapture, that many Jews will turn to Christ, such as every guide I've had to Israel, except for one year, in my, uh, like 15 trips, they've been a, a Israeli Jew and Jewish by faith, but uh, we share the gospel. And I think once that happens, many Jews will go, oh, well, I guess they were right. <laughs> and they place their faith in Jesus. And we think these are Jewish Christian evangelists in the future. Now, other views then say, no, what this is talking about is not literal, but symbolically these, these Christians that are on fire for Jesus and sharing the gospel with others even now. So they'd say it like this. 12 is a, a biblical number God uses, 12 disciples based on the 12 tribes of Israel. And so 12 is a number God uses, 12 times 12, and then 1,000. God uses periods of 1,000 as well. So they'd say those are symbolic numbers for followers of Jesus throughout this church age. So uh, that your interpretation of that would depend upon, do you believe these three sets of seven judgments, the seven seals, so starting in chapter six, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. Are they one after the other? Do they overlap some? Do they overlap a lot? And are they literal or symbolic? So I tend to take those literal in, in the future. Historical premillennialists would take them typically symbolic, but toward the end of the seals as literal in these cataclysmic signs before the return of Christ. And so then, by the way, if you interpret it literal or symbolic, then would then help you understand whether you think, are we going through some of that right now or not? And are those 144,000 literal? If they're literal, I think the literalist interpretation 
would be in the future, and that's the view I have, but the symbolic would be that would be either now or through history, God has used special people to share the gospel. Now, every Christian is supposed to, but not everybody has the gift of evangelism. Yeah, we're all full to evangelism, even if we have the gift or not. That's right. Do you teach a elective on Revelation, if not you? Who does teach that? How often does that come if a student if someone here wants to jump in on that class in the future? Yeah, so I'm teaching it right. I'm teaching it right now. Dr. Hoskins taught it the time before, and I'll probably teach it in another two years. Okay. We're teaching it this, and it's it's a English-based book. So we teach both English-based New Testament books or Greek-based. And so, you know, we go through the Greek text if it's a Greek-based course, which you'll need to go through the Greek courses to get the basics in before that. Or English-based, anyone can jump into it. And so we'll probably do the English based in another, let's say, two years. Let's, let's that. say theoretically, I'm sure this doesn't happen to a Southwestern alum. Let's just say theoretically, they've not kept up their languages and they want to jump in on that Greek uh, course. Um, what would you say to them? I would say if you want to brush up on your Greek, there's some good books on that that um, Zondervan's published. In other words, brush, other words, on brush the up on it. Yeah. If, if I, you want to take a Greek course in it, you need to brush up on your Greek. If I can't conjugate can't, luau yeah. at the drop of a hat at 2 o'clock in the morning, I better go to the English. You not say luau is in Hawaii, but luau is in Luau, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I felt, you can tell it's been a while since I've been there. Here's the thing. You mentioned Lagos, Bible study software. Lagos and Accordance, and I'd add Bible works, but they're now no longer in business. Okay. But I'm telling you, and by the way, earlier... I know some people don't have a sense of humor, so I wasn't saying don't buy money for food. Do buy money for food, but buy the books. But electronically, you know, I have to admit, if you don't know Greek and Hebrew, you can still go very far with Lagos and Accordance. And so you have your English text in front of you with one little click of the cursor you know, on yeah. their mouse. It gives you the Hebrew or Greek, depending yeah. on if you're in the Old Testament or New. It'll conjugate it. It'll tell you what the meaning possibilities are. Another, just one click, every verse, that other verse that has that. Yeah. So you can go very far with Praise it. the Lord for the right click. <laughs> That's right. We've got a qu question from Wes Grant. He wants to know, at what point does the marriage supper of the Lamb occur? And then he, he's asking if you contrast that between historical pre and premillennial. Yeah, so um, the premillennial is the only view that says there's a literal millennium. So with the I and the post, you know, I says no, so I says no millennium, Jesus is just coming back. And so with that, you know, if they take that literally, I don't know that I'm millennialist necessarily would, but if, if they take it literally, they say, well, that's when Jesus comes back. Um, then a, a post millennial would say, well, there's not a, sp a certain length of period, but we're in that now. And then Jesus is going to come back, and they'd put it then. Now, the premillennial, then, that we say, yes, he's coming back, both historical and dispensational. Yes, he's coming back. There will be a thousand-year millennium, though some premillennial don't say it's a thousand. They'll say it's a period of time, maybe a little less, a little more. Um, th then the great white throne judgment. So the <laughs> marriage supper of the Lamb, that's a good question. I don't think that there's any set spot even in premillennialism, as to when it is. Okay. Um, so, for instance, with my view that there's a seven-year Great Tribulation, there'll be the rapture, then the seven-year Great Tribulation, which again, this, the dispensational premillennial. We think it's sometime during the Great Tribulation, but even then, we don't know when. Now, in Revelation, in night, John 19, it mentions it right before the return of Christ. And so then you look at it and say, well, that's easy right before the return of Christ, with those that are with Christ. And yet, this is the, the challenge of Revelation, and I'm glad, because I, I haven't said this yet, Revelation is not all chronological. And so that's that's very important to understand that. It's not. And John, you know, John, I believe, wrote Revelation. John wrote the Gospel of John. John wrote the three epistles of John. And John likes to do what we call proleptic, and then he'll mention something. He'll mention Mary, and John will say, now, that's the Mary that anointed Jesus. He'll jump to that event that hasn't happened yet. Or then sometimes he'll mention something that's a flashback. Mm -hmm. So proleptic, if you're not familiar with that word, just take flash forward, mm -hmm. flashback. 
a word Schreiner likes to use in his commentary a lot is recapitulation. Mm. So what he's saying is, well, here, John's going back over that. Like in 17 and, and Babylon judgment, in 18, he'll recapitulate and go back. So the point is, mentioning that before the return of Christ, is John mentioning it there, but it's really a flashback? Because, you know, in Revelation 12, I think he flashes back to the fall of Satan. So it can be at the beginning of the uh, the millennium. It could be during the millennium. It could be at the end of it. Um, it could, be, And that would be a flash forward. Mm-hmm. Or it could be right before the return of Christ with those believers that are in heaven. Because I do believe that, again, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And every believer that dies, whether Old Testament say, those who had the faith of Abraham, Genesis 15, 6, or a Christian, are with the Lord now. So my final answer is, I've got an idea what I think it is, but I don't know that we can, We I certainly think we shouldn't be dogmatic on that. But it's kind of like the judgment, 1 Corinthians 10, 3 through 15, the judgment for Christians of what will be rewarded or not. When is that? Well, you know, we're not, we're not sure, really. And I would add that if you start saying the words recapic- recapitulation and prolipsis in your sermons, yeah. then get, empower the pastor's wife to be able to tell you, it's sweetheart. Would you just keep it simple, and would you would you leave? We we all know you're yeah. smart, but so, just just preach Texan or wherever you're Oklahoma or whatever. Yeah, flash back and flash forward yeah. work well. All right, so uh, Lit, Brother Litchfield here. This is a great question. I, I I've never heard this one, so I've heard Brother Litchfield says that Jesus reference and no one knows the day hour could reference the feast of trumpets that that hid that that is the second coming could therefore coincide with the fall festivals as his coming coincide with the spring festivals have you heard something similar yeah i mean there are there's a million views about Mm -hmm. uh, that's my exaggeration i'm a texan by the way so i do like i I exaggerate it comes naturally (laughs) but there are many views about when he's coming back and could it be tied to this feast or festival and and admitted to admittedly as you look at the history of Israel, a lot has happened on their feasts and festival days because their enemies know that's when they'll be mm-hmm. worshiping and, and not ready for an attack. Even over the last half century, yeah, their yeah. enemies have come and yeah. gone that way. But that doesn't mean Jesus is coming back at, at that time. So I would say that, I mean, I've heard that view. I've heard many that claim he's coming back at this feast or festival in this certain year. But the problem is, <clears throat> excuse me, that gets back to date setting. So mm. I just take it, I just tell people, look, I'm simple-minded and let's keep it simple. And I think Jesus was just saying, no one's going to know. And to try to then say, oh, but he's talking about this feast. You can know when he's coming back. You just don't know when that feast is or something like that. I well, think that's... I think without <laughs> date setting, you could also you know, add that as a, as a piece of commentary uh, as you're teaching that you know this is a a theory, and, and you can look for this. So that's, sure, that's yeah. really good. Yeah. I mean, as far as telling people, there are those that think it might be tied to a feast or festival. And I think that's fine with saying, could it be? Maybe yeah. it could be. But to say it definitely is. I love I love Mark's question. It's the last one here, because I've got a guy in my congregation who's, I've been there 12 years, and he's been writing a prophecy book the whole 12 years. So we always have these guys in our churches. Mark says, I encounter mm-hmm. people who are distracted by the book of Revelation, uh, Mark, I hear you. They catch you before and after service when guests are there. Uh, they just they take yeah. 20, 30 minutes on their view. Yeah. How do you redirect those conversations, and where do you redirect them? Great question. Mark. Good. So I think they're going overboard on on Revelation 1, 3. Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it. So I'll mention that first to pastors that shy away from that. Then I encourage you to do it, to preach and teach through it, and help your people have that blessing uh, that God says. And interesting, those who hear, because until the printing press, most of the way people got God's word was they heard it because they couldn't afford to buy a copy of the Bible. But then also help your people to learn balance. And anytime if you get, you can be doing something good, but if it's to the the uh, the omission of something else that's good, then you're out of balance. So mm. I think. And help them to understand a proper interpretation of Revelation should make you a better witness for Christ and a more godly person. Because what we sometimes don't talk about in Revelation are the passages that talk about godliness versus ungodliness. And so 
then it should lead us to live a more godly life that then is balanced by reading the entire Word of God and doing what it says and sharing with others. So somebody locked up in their study every day studying Revelation, they're not doing what the Word of God says to do. Mark, great question. Dr. Wicker, thank you. And I would add Mark to that. Uh, When my hair turned gray and I got a doctorate, my church (laughs) thought I was smarter than I was. But depends on how long you've been there, um, what what your respect is in the congregation. If you're someone like myself, I can put my arm around them, and, and I, I have a comical way of just saying, you know what, I'm so glad you're here, and you teach me these things, and I'm so glad you can be wrong, and now let's let's go get a donut or let's go yeah. do something together. Yeah. Well, Dr. Wicker, thank you for uh, helping us today. You've been a, a great blessing. I'm told back in the day, prior to being a professor, you were a comedian, yeah, uh, and you do a little acting in your classes, and so I know there's been some questions about alumni auditing, and maybe they'll jump in with you, and maybe at that point, when we pay money, you can give us your best revelation joke and can <laughs> act out uh, the four horsemen or whatever you might do. But in all seriousness, thank you for teaching here uh, for for a number of years. You came when uh, I was doing my doctoral studies with Dr. Fish, and so thank you, and thank you for today. Your tremendous blessing to us at Southwestern, and Thank you for being faithful to the Lord. You're welcome. And thank you for your serving the Lord and the pastorate and for being part of this today. I I really appreciate it. I I think we're going to close it off and head it back to Becca.